Hosanna, hey, Zanna, 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 Hosanna, hey, Zanna, Hosanna. Good morning, everybody. It's so good to have you joining together through the miracle of digital technology on this sixth Sunday of Lent, Palm the Passion Sunday. I hope that wherever you are and, uh, and that you are healthy and well in body, mind, and spirit, and that you know that no matter who you are or where you come from or where you are in your journey through life, that you are loved by God and you are loved here at Kensington Community Church. It is the first Sunday of the month, and it is the Sunday in which we would normally be celebrating communion, so we're going to be going through a kind of a virtual communion service a little later on in our worshipful experience. So I encourage you to grab some, some bread. If you're sick of the gluten-free matzah that we use here at Kensington Community Church, it is, here's your opportunity to get some bread that is full of gluten, uh, as well as some fruit of the vine. And I invite you to use your discretion on that. Whatever kind of fruit of the vine you would like to use, kind of gather those elements about you, and we're going to be using those a little bit later on uh, in our service. But as we begin worship this morning, going to God, uh, on this last Sunday of Lent, as we begin our journey into Holy Week, I invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Creator God, eternal parent of us all, Brother Christ, who hears us in our times of need, Holy Spirit, Sister, who melts us and molds us, fills us and uses us, as we pick up our cross and follow Christ this day, this moment, this week. We ask that you would alight our hearts with the flame of love so that it may burn brightly for our love of God, our love of neighbor, and our love of self. Be with us in this hour and each day of our lives until that time in which we go into glory and we pass into life beyond life. We pray this in your mercies, O God, and all of God's children said, Amen. Our sacred story this morning is one of the most influential writings in the Old Testament on early Christian thought about the life and death of Christ. It is found in the prophecy of Isaiah, and it is called the Song of the Suffering Servant. Hear these words from Isaiah's prophecy, chapter 53, verses 1 through 12, and listen for the word of God for you this day. Who has believed what we have heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. 
Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of God for the children of God. May the still-speaking God speak to us this day. Good morning. It's Palm Sunday. Thanks for being with me here today. This week, I've been thinking about the things that you're missing out on. That you might be stuck at home most of the time. You might not be going out a lot. You might see your friends, but certainly not in person. And you're missing school. I think that can make you feel bummed and sad, bored, you know? So imagine this. Think of this as your life path. You know, what is your, your heart, your mind, and your spirit? And you're feeling kind of, you know, bummed. That's what your path might look like. And believe it or not, while you're on this path, God is with you. The Holy Spirit is with you. And Jesus is with you. They trust you, they love you, and they know that good things will come from what feels difficult at the time. They also know that in difficult times, there are surprises and changes that we can't always anticipate but that are there. We just have to look for them. Things like, let's see, being able to write music, having more time to do something like that, to have more time to play with your big brother or sister, And maybe hmm, time to actually spend with your family, eating dinner together every night. Really special things that would you wouldn't you know you'd be surprised would make you feel good in these kinds of times when you're not doing all the things you feel like you should normally be doing. There's great joy and beauty and love to be had, even when these feelings are going on, and surprises. When I thought about making this, I didn't know exactly what my path would be, so I'm surprised by the actual path. Um, I'm surprised by the way the colors mixed, and I did want some dripping but I am surprised in the way that it's dripping and some of the beauty that's developed here. And your path is no different than this. So take this image, maybe a part of it, whatever part you like, <laughs> and put it in your head, you know? Put it somewhere back here for later so that you can imagine the brilliance, the color, and the change that came from, came from, I know, just mixing blue and yellow. But even with blue and yellow, there's a complexity and a richness that's here that we didn't anticipate before. God and the Holy Spirit and Jesus are with you in these 
difficult and challenging situations you might find yourself in. And they love you. And I love you. Let us pray. Dear God, when we are struggling, please shower us with your love. Please grant us the patience to wait to uncover the good, for in change and growth there is always good. And give us those beautiful moments, those surprises, to show us the beauty and the love that are in us and everyone and everything around us. And all God's children said, Amen. I hope you take this idea with you just for this week and think about some things that are going on for you right now while you're home and how the way you view them could turn around just a little bit with some color, some love, and an openness to change. I love you all, and I'll see you next week. We have come to the final track on our playlist through Lent, what we are calling Deep Cuts, those, those songs found in our sacred story, the biblical witness, which we might not have been aware of before this Lenten season began. We started with track one, which was the Song of Moses, found in the book of Deuteronomy, which, which looked up upon the mountaintop Moses did and looked back from where they came throughout the wilderness and, and said to God, we ain't where we're gonna be. We ain't where we ought to be, but thank God we ain't where we used to be. We then went to track two, which was this feminist anthem called the Song of Deborah found in the book of Judges, which sings of God's provisions and thanks and gra gratitude that God puts people in our lives to shepherd us through tough times. Then we got a little bluesy with the Song of Job, who who, who sings of the unfairness and random tragedies of the world and gives witness to the lamentations of our age. Then we got a little funky. We got a little flirtatious with the Song of Songs, which reminded us that it's okay to find pleasure in this life. If the other songs were full of nourishment and spiritual sustenance, then the Song of Songs says sometimes you just need a cheat day, and sometimes the most spiritual thing you can consume are some em empty calories of pleasure and joy. Then last week we sat in a cell, sheltering in place with Brother Paul, as we sang the song of Christ's humility until it was tattooed on our hearts and we were reminded that Christ is with us in this very moment in the fragility of the human condition. These songs are like tracks on a fantastic and phenomenal gospel album which speaks words of wisdom and grace, faith and perseverance, mercy and justice. And today, we conclude with one of the most important and influential songs found in the Hebrew Bible, which informed the great theologies of the ancient church. We are singing the fourth part of a four-part song that's found in the prophecy of Isaiah. It is called the Song of the Suffering Servant. Christians read parts of this song every Good Friday. It is the song which illustrates what kind of love we are truly talking about when we talk about the love of God found in Christ Jesus. The themes of Isaiah's songs echo like an old hymn which asks the question, What wondrous love is this, O my soul, O my soul? What wondrous love is this, O my soul? What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse of my soul, of my soul, to bear the dreadful curse of my soul. Make no mistake about it. When we read the gospel accounts of that very first Palm Sunday procession into Jerusalem, none of the people waving palms and throwing cloaks down on the street had any idea that we, they would be thinking about Isaiah's song of the suffering servant decades later. Make no mistake about it, when we read the various versions of Christ's arrest and trial in the four gospel accounts, none of the women or men who called themselves Christ's disciple were thinking of Isaiah's song as he was going 
through that and make no mistake about it when all of them were huddled in fear in the upper room on that saturday after christ was lynched for crimes he did not commit and they watched his lifeless body of their friend and teacher placed in a tomb and a stone rolled in front of its entrance none of those people sitting in the upper room on that very first easter saturday let alone let said let's open up the scroll of the prophet isaiah and sing the song of the suffering servant we might get a clue about what's going on none of them did that so how did this song become to mean so much to us in the Christian faith. The Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III, senior minister at Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago, Illinois, played a little thought experiment with this in mind. He wondered if the people who had witnessed the, the arrest, trial, and crucifixion in real time might have wondered why Christ didn't run away in the Garden of Gethsemane, why he didn't speak up in his defense in front of the Sanhedrin, why he did not beg Pilate for his life to be spared. The crowds who were watching all of this take place in public must have been thinking, this poor man, what is he expecting to accomplish by being executed? But Reverend Moss says where these onlookers get it wrong is that Christ isn't trying to save his own body. He's trying to save the soul of the world. Christ is teaching us and showing us what it means to walk in the way all the way up to suffering and death. His passion is like a neon sign flashing a warning. Don't you see how messed up all of this is? Don't you realize how wrong all of this is? Don't you see how this violates the very image of God? Because if, we can't stay, see, because if we can't, then the state of our collective soul seems to be in serious trouble. Well, sisters and brothers, the state of our collective soul seems to be in serious trouble. There is something broken that needs to be redeemed. And Christ did what looked pointless on the outside looking in. Christ held space. Christ held sacred space. He held all of our iniquities and infirmities and indiscretions and a willingness to bear with courage and love. He held what was immoral. He held what was wrong. He held what was broken for the restoration of all of creation and the salvation of our souls. This is what we call, sisters and brothers, redemptive suffering. From the suffering of the righteous comes the redemption of the world. And the church came along later, decades later, picked up the scroll of Isaiah and read through it like Christ must have did on that very start of his ministry in his home synagogue of Galilee. And they discovered the song of the suffering servant. And they said, this is it. This is it. This is a gold record. Don't believe me? The great reformer Martin Luther wrote of Isaiah's song of the suffering servant. The words in the song, our, us, for us, must be written in letters of gold. The servant is not suffering for the sake of suffering. The servant's suffering in the song and the servant's death in the song is a revelation of God's mercy. The whole point of the song is that we are no longer defined by our sins. We are no longer defined by our transgressions or iniquities. We are no longer defined by our sorrows and our fears. When we look into the mirror, when we look at a family member, when we look at a friend, when we look at a stranger, when we look at an opponent, when we look even at an enemy, their sin, their transgression, their iniquities, their sorrows, and their fears do not define them. God's mercy and love defines us all. The song of the suffering servant says the servant suffered our iniquities and our infirmities in order to show us a love that will not let us go. Isaiah's song leaves no room, sisters and brothers, for selfishness, for entitlement, or for apathy. It champions compassion over justice, humility over ego, dignity over othering, and forgiveness over scapegoating. The song calls us more deeply into the mystery of our faith. And the song of the suffering servant shows us a love of God that removes the scales from our eyes and softens the hardening of our hearts 
to show us what we ought to have known all along, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God, blessed and beautiful this day, and there is grace in painful experiences. And the way to wholeness and the way to redemption, the way that is based on the truth that gives us an abundance of life, does not avoid suffering, but it walks through it with courage and with hope. I was on a call this past week with my good friend, the Reverend Dr. Daniel DeLeon of Friends Congregational Church in College Station, Texas. And on the call, he shared with me this. A member of Dan's church emailed him this past week, and attached to the email was a letter, a letter, uh, a letter the member had written to her children in case she died from COVID-19. She wrote to Dan saying, I wrote a little note to my children in case I die of the coronavirus. Not expecting it, but you never know. I'm sure there is an extra grief that comes from not being able to be with your loved ones, she wrote in the email, even though you are very close by. That type of grief is what my little note is about. I thought I would pass it along to you, Dan, in case the thoughts could be of any small comfort to someone else. Dan shared the note with me. I cried when he did. It touched me that deeply. And honestly, it's one of the most beautiful and most courageous and most hopeful things I've read in a really long time. I asked Dan to ask the mother who wrote the letter if I could share her note to her children with you. And with her permission, I want to read you the note this mother wrote to her children. To my beloved children and grandchildren, if you are reading this, then I, like many others, have succumbed to the coronavirus. I died without you by my side and body, but please know that I did not die alone or scared. You were always with me, every second of every day. I heard your laughter and it cheered me. I, heard, I felt the warmth of your hands and it calmed me. I heard your voice and it soothed me. God is love and God brought me your presence into my heart to comfort me. Do not worry, my beloved ones. I was never alone. God shepherded me, and you were always there by my side through it all. Sisters and brothers, let us sing the song of the suffering servant, for it is a deep cut of our faith. And let us sing it this week, this hour, this moment, for Christ is beckoning to us to pick up our cross and follow him. Never once in the entirety of all the gospel accounts, never in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John did Christ say to his followers, worship me. He never said, worship me. He implored them. He implored them all, and he calls to us this day to follow him. And I've got some good news that's going to sound like bad news. <laughs> when we follow Christ Jesus, we will be led into suffering. Now, God isn't ordaining that suffering or putting that suffering on us. The song of the suffering servant says, Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him struck, stricken, struck and down by God and afflicted. But by his bruises we are healed. For the suffering of the righteous save the world. Let us sing the song of the suffering servant. For God is with us through the worst of our suffering. Let us sing the song of the suffering servant. For God doesn't leave us in our suffering. And let us sing the song of the suffering servant. Because the world, sister and brothers, may break us. But God puts us back together. With love and with grace and with mercy. And as we walk with Christ in his passion this week as we walk into the unknown of this day, as we walk in this very moment knowing it may, may very well be our last, let us do so with the song of the suffering servant, this eternal song singing in our hearts, for it portrays a, 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 a sacred and profound truth 
that we are never alone. God shepherds us through the wilderness, up to a mountain, and down into the promised land. God finds us on our Good Fridays, when we are found to be crucified and put into a tomb with a stone rolled in front, and God pushes it away so that we may shout our alleluias on Easter Day. We have a way of remembering that, based on the sacred stories of profound truth of our faith, grounded in the profound truth that when God hears our cries, God is there to listen and to hear and to respond. It is the story that, that Christ told his disciples on the night that he was betrayed and arrested and died, and it is a story that we share around a communion table so that we may be lifted up and empowered and filled up with the courage and mercies and peace of Christ this day to share with those that we meet. We gather around this table as we gather, you gather around your table, as Christians gather around the world this day to take bread as he did that day and to bless it and to break it and to share it saying, take, eat, all of you, for this is my body broken for you. And likewise, after the meal, we take the cup and he blessed it, and he lifted it high, giving thanks to God for it, and he passed it among his disciples and friends, saying, take, drink, all of you, for this is the cup of the new everlasting covenant, poured out for the forgiveness of sin. And each time that you gather around this table and you eat of this bread and you drink from this cup, remember me. Remember how much I loved you. Remember how much I taught you. Remember how I showed you the truth and the way and the life. And remember that there is nothing in heaven or on earth that can separate you from the love of God in me. At this time, sisters and brothers, I invite you to share the communion table and the, these, these elements of grace, these gifts of God for the children of God in your home at this time, knowing that as we do, we do so together around the table of Christ. Thank you. 
the bread of affliction that is the bread of life, the cup of expectation, which is the cup of covenant. Let us partake of these gifts of grace, these gifts of love, these gifts of God for the children of God with a grateful heart this day. And let us pray. O grace-filled and holy God, we give you thanks for what you have done, what you are doing now, and for the miracles you have yet to work, more wondrous than we can even imagine. We thank you that in the fullness of time you gave us Jesus, your beloved Son, who came from love, lived and loved, and even when his friends betrayed him, he loved them to the end. He listened for your Holy Spirit, O God, even as its power rearranged people's lives. That same Spirit raised him from the bounds of death, and it pours out upon us even now, on friends gathered around your tables in grace, and on what we eat and what we drink. O Holy One, make us one with each other, make us one with you, until we love our neighbors as we love ourselves, until we see you clearly, face to face, and until we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that love is even stronger than death. This prayer we lift up to you this day, O God, including a prayer of, our, of thanksgiving for all of the many blessings and the beauty of this day. We pray for those who are mourning and grieving that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon them and that you would comfort them and strengthen them. We pray for those who are ailing a body, mind, or spirit. We ask, O oh God, that you would heal them by your, by, your, by your agents of healing grace, and that you would make them whole. We pray for those who are living in violent and war-torn areas of our world and in our backyards, maybe even inside of their own homes. We ask for their protection, their safety, and that they would be liberated from the tyranny of their lives. And we pray, O oh God, for your wisdom and grace this day, to make us more friendly, more compassionate, more merciful to ourselves and to others. Into these prayers, O oh God, we ask in your mercy that you hear them this day as we wait anxiously for their answering. For we were taught to bring everything to you in prayer when Christ Jesus taught us these ancient and sacred words to pray. Our God, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Save us from times of trial, and deliver us from all that is evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and forever. Amen. strong. 